This week, a Queens crackdown on prostitution, drugs, illegal street vendors, and other quality of life issues. Plus, a double shooting leaves one man dead and another injured. And... Come on, how are you gonna hurt your child like that? Parents face charges in the death of their four-year-old son. Right now, Fox 5's Crime in the City. For our first story this week, we begin in Midtown Manhattan. That's where the NYPD's Detective Bureau is tracking a dangerous Venezuelan gang made up of young migrants, some just 11 years old, who are believed to have arrived as New York City experienced an influx of asylum seekers. Law enforcement officials are keeping a close eye on gang-related criminal activity all around the city. The NYPD's Detective Bureau is tracking the dangerous Venezuelan gang Tren de Aragua. It's made up of young migrants, some just 11 years old, and believed to have arrived here in New York during the migrant surge. Well, police say their crimes are becoming more brazen. The members even posting their weapons on social media. I mean, look at this picture. This is crazy. Joining us right now is the assistant chief. Chief Jason Savino from the NYPD Detective Bureau. Nice to have you here. Thanks so what for being you, with us. What are, you, what are you seeing on the streets of New York City? What's the problem? Yeah, I mean, we have the same concerns. We look at those pictures, tremendously concerning. But right now, what we have, I like to call a perfect storm of sorts, where we have individuals tremendously brazen, absolutely ruthless, individuals that have committed a multitude of crimes with basically no repercussions. You know, so it, what started out as a robbery crew, upwards of 50 robberies, 20 individuals Ooh. arrested for upwards of 50 robberies with, and out of those 20 individuals, every single one of them is on the streets today. So, That's crazy. Now, there are reports that they're operating the Roosevelt Hotel, which used to be a very nice hotel in New York City. Now it's a migrant shelter. How, what, what are we talking about? What's going in, on inside this hotel that is now spilling out into the Times Square area? Yeah, I mean, there's actually a recruitment process, and this is the first time we've seen structure with Trende Aragua. We, Formerly, it was kind of scattered all over the place, but now we're seeing that structure where there's actually kick-ups, where people are recruiting these younger members as young as 11, and they've been described in some of these robbery incidents as young as eight years old. And when they're arrested, like I said, virtually no repercussions. You know, we know at a minimum they have access to guns. Why? We see the posts on social media. We know they've, at, at, at a minimum, committed gunpoint robberies. Now think about this. They're also calling out Latin kings. So put that all together in the middle of Times Square. It's a recipe for potential disaster. Is this focused on Times Square? It is in and around Times Square. I mean, the, the crew's name, Los Diablos de la 42, and it, the 42 stands for 42nd Street. So that's their threshold. That's where they feel comfortable. That's where they post their social media. By the way, what is it? The Devils of 42nd the Street? The Little Devils of 42nd Street. So yes. are you talking about two different gangs here? It's actually a subset of Trende Aragua, and it's the first one we've seen of that type, and it's the the first one that we've seen call out oppositions, and that's our concern. Do people outside of Times Square, which primarily are tourists, do we need to be concerned in other places, other boroughs around the city, other neighborhoods? I mean, obviously, we're monitoring every gang in the city. You know, this is the first splinter off, but we'll be monitoring them, and if, rest assured, if they do splinter off again, we'll be on top are of them. Are you concerned about a gang war? I mean, we always are, you know. Because when the, these young kids are calling out the Latin ga gangs, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, we, these we, are the Venezuelan gangs. Yes, we do believe there's a spillover from Venezuela where a homicide did occur, so this could be the continued from Venezuela, tremendously concerning, but that would could ignite the fire. We're on top of it, and we'll certainly prevent so it. So let me ask you, uh, the city council today, there were reports that they're meeting to figure out what to do with these young kids who came to our country illegally, who were unaccompanied by a parent. They say we have like the highest population, uh, one of the highest populations of unaccompanied migrants in this city. Is it easy for these gangs to recruit these kids? Yeah, I mean, you look at the number one reason 
that individuals join any gang, and that's lack of family structure, right? So if an individual lacks family structure, they're certainly more vulnerable and easy to recruit, easier to join the gang. Can they put them in foster homes rather than leave them in uh, a shelter without any kind of supervision? Yeah, I'm sure there's other options. Obviously, we would work closely with uh, all of our counterparts to find them, and hopefully we could find sound solutions. It's, it's lack of family structure, lack of things to do, all this kind of rolls into one, and this provides them an opportunity. Why do you think they're recruiting specifically eight-year-olds, 11-year-olds, going for the younger kids? Yeah, because there's relatively no repercussions. I mean, we're, like, we're talking about a group that works off of bets, you know, where they'll stand on a corner and say, hey, I bet you won't rob that individual. If you don't, you have to lick the transit floor mm -hmm. or have to jump towards the train tracks, things like that. That sort of repercussion, that sort of empowerment from not being punished from, from criminality, criminality without consequence, that empowerment enables them to really just have the goal to commit these crimes. And the main reason there's no repercussions because of the age. And because of because the, of juveniles. Yeah, because and of the bail age and bail, and bail reforms. I mean, we, we put a lot on our DA. We have to look at our judges as well. All right, one last question. So you're talking about Times Square, you're talking about the Roosevelt Hotel. But there's got to be, it's just in those two areas, or you're talking about across the five boroughs? I, I mean, we, we do see it elsewhere, but that Times Square is a draw. You have to remember, that's the gem of the city. You know, when you could post up in Times Square, that's the creme de la creme. You know, that's our crown jewel. People want to be in and around Times Square. It has a status symbol, and that's where they want to be. Assistant Chief Jason Savino, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for keeping our, everybody safe, not only just us who, who live here, but those who come to our great city and don't want to leave, you know, a victim. And for bringing attention to this for everybody. Well, and thank you for your cooperation. All thank right. you for telling the story. We now go to Jackson Heights in Queens, where an effort focusing on quality of life concerns and crime is underway to clean up Roosevelt Avenue. Fox 5 was there as police and other officials gathered to do a sweep of the street that is plagued with problems. Fox 5's Richard Jacobus is live for us. Richard, what's going on? Well, Natasha Steve, our sources call this Operation Roosevelt. It's a 60-day initiative to clean up the stretch of Roosevelt Avenue from Elmhurst to Jackson Heights, Queens. It all begins today from cracking down on these illegal vendors to busting brothels to cleaning up garbage on the streets and seizing illegal scooters. All of it to clean up and bring back this neighborhood's quality of life. Just after dawn, hundreds of NYPD officers, state police officers, members of the FDNY, sanitation workers, and even the Queens DA gathered at 83rd and Roosevelt to begin the process of cleaning up what people here have been complaining about for years. Prostitution, um, people doing, selling illegal drugs and everything. We don't need that over here. Cops spent the day tracking down alleged sex workers, dismantling vendors selling illegal clothing, and taking away illegal scooters from street corners. Our folks that, do, that are, are vending on the, right, on the right, corners, right. Uh, you'll see women that are scantily clad right, uh, right. On, on the street, uh, you know, offering services of, right. of massages. Interim Police Commissioner Tom Donlin spent last night with NYPD Deputy Commissioner of Operations Kaz Daughtry touring Roosevelt Avenue ahead of the crackdown. We're going to provide more resources to you here. Here. As for the people who live here or own a business here, they applaud this initiative, especially because of their kids. I noticed that the business started to go down, but um, then oh, they crashed it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then across the street we have a school. We have a school across the street. Uh, kids from, I think, five years old, they attend to school, and I guess it's not a good thing. Uh, it's, a, it's not a good thing. I was born and raised here just down the block, so um, it has been for several years already. So I feel like it's, it's, it's a good thing that they're actually doing that because of the kids, you know. The youth is growing, the, um, them passing by. I don't want personally my kids to be seeing all of those things. And those are the people who are concerned the most, those with children, those who have lived here their entire lives. They've seen this neighborhood go downhill. Now, we've reached out to the NYPD as well as the Queens District Attorney and the Department of Sanitation for official comment on this on actually what this is called. Our sources say it's Operation Roosevelt, what they're doing here and if they're indeed going to be here for the next 60 days. But so far, we haven't heard back. Our sources again say they'll be back here tomorrow for day two. 
Up in Harlem, a father has been arrested and charged in connection with the death of his four-year-old son, just days after the boy's mother was also charged. A sad and shocking update in the death of a four-year-old boy in Harlem. All right, now not only is his mother charged in his death, but his father's been arrested and is facing the same charges. Fox 5 Sharon Crowley live outside criminal court in Lower Manhattan tonight with the latest Sharon. Stephen Natasha, police are telling us that the investigation into this tragedy is ongoing. And now we are learning tonight that both the mother and the father will be facing criminal charges. They will be brought here to uh, the criminal courthouse in Lower Manhattan to face those charges, possibly overnight or in the coming days. Now, this is something that has really stunned that neighborhood in Harlem. Some of the neighbors even saying they didn't even know that little boy was living there. The father of a four-year-old little boy who was found unresponsive and later died at the hospital is now facing criminal charges. 25-year-old Laron Modlin has been arrested for criminally negligent homicide and endangering the welfare of a child. The boy's mother, 26-year-old Natavia Ragsdale, was arrested Monday and is facing the same counts. Come on, how are you going to hurt your child like that? That's your child. You gave birth to it. Neighbors put flowers and candles outside the Harlem apartment building where the little boy lived with his mother and three other children. Police responded Sunday to a 911 call of an unconscious child inside this apartment building on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard in Harlem. Upon arrival, officers observed a four year old unconscious and unresponsive. EMS took the boy to Harlem Hospital where he died hours later. The medical examiner said the exact cause of the child's death is still under investigation. Sources say the boy appeared severely undernourished and that social services had paid a visit to the home in the past. I feel like this here um, is a blessing to have a child. If you can't take care of a child, then um, you shouldn't have him. You can go and take him, you know, um, put him up for adoption. That's it. NYPD officers from the Elite Emergency Services Unit entered the home to make sure there were no other kids inside. Many people in this neighborhood say they saw the mother about, but never with the boy. I didn't even know the young lady had a baby because I give free gifts and candy out all holiday around. I know all the kids up and down the block and the school around the corner. So I'm very shocked to hear this. And as we said, this uh, police telling us that this investigation is ongoing. And one of the aspects of this investigation, of course, is the medical examiner's report. And we understand from them tonight that they are still doing testing to try to figure out the exact cause of death of this little four-year-old. That, of course, could impact the charges against both his parents. Down in lower Manhattan, a man was fatally shot and another was wounded in a shooting that took place just a few blocks from NYPD headquarters. We begin with a developing story out of Lower Manhattan, where two people are shot. One man is dead now, and another has been wounded. Police say this happened around 7:15 this evening near the intersection of Madison and Catherine Streets, just a few blocks from police headquarters. The man who was killed was shot in the neck. A second victim was shot in the lower body. We are told he is in stable condition. So far, no word on any arrests or what led up to the shooting. We now leave the city for Yonkers, where police are investigating an apparent murder-suicide that left two people dead inside of their home. Fifth grade teacher killed at home her three kids inside the house when she was murdered. All right, and tonight police say it was a murder-suicide. We're going to get right to Richard Giacobas in East Chester with the story still developing at 5 o'clock tonight. Richard. Steve, Natasha, it's difficult to put into words how this Eastchester school community is feeling today. This is a community that is made up of parents and students who love their schools and love their special teachers. Arlene O'Neill was one of those special educators, a fifth grade teacher here at Ann Hutchinson Elementary School for more than two decades. According to Yonkers Police, O'Neill and her husband, a retired NYPD detective, were found in their home in Tuckahoe this morning in an apparent murder-suicide. Investigators say that a dispute took place resulting in Arlene's husband, Sean, shooting the 47-year-old teacher multiple times with a handgun before turning the gun on himself. A source tells us that the husband and wife got into an argument 
that started Tuesday night, which escalated and then continued into this morning. The couple have three children, according to police. All three of them attended the same school district where their mother taught. In a letter to parents, East Chester School Superintendent Ronald Valenti writes that the district is, quote, shocked and saddened by this development and has mobilized the district crisis team, as well as resources from neighboring districts, including Bronxville and Southern Westchester BOCES, in order to provide comfort to students, faculty, and other staff members as they process this news. Parents we spoke with, we also spoke with a former student of Miss O'Neill, describe her as a special lady who loved her kids as much as her teaching. She was a great person. Uh, I really loved her as a teacher. And every parent I know is just very sad, shocked, and thinking of the victims' families. She was wonderful. She's been here for 20 years. Wonderful. Everyone loved her. All extracurricular and after-school activities were canceled across the district today. Some parents we spoke with say they're in the early stages of planning some type of memorial and vigil into this community, a community where all of these parents took their children home tonight and are trying to talk to them about how to process all this. How do you process all of it? And finally, a trial date for alleged serial killer Rex Hewerman could be set as early as December, according to a judge. Out of Long Island, where suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Sherman was back in court today. He came face to face with the judge in his case. Fox Eyes Jody Goldberg reports from outside the courthouse. He understands he's going to have his day in court, but it's just going to take a while to get to that point. Suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Hewerman is in it for the long haul. This according to his attorney, who says his client, charged with murdering six sex workers over the past three decades, maintains his innocence. Dressed in a black jacket with a blue shirt and tie, Hewerman stood stoically and silently. I've told him it's going to be a long process. Almost all of the digital evidence from hundreds of Hewerman's electronic devices have been turned over to the defense with a December deadline in place to hand over the rest. Given the ridiculous nature of our discovery laws where I have to provide every single piece of paper that was generated in a case that started in 1993. That's what we have to do. Suffolk District Attorney Ray Tierney says in order to turn over terabytes worth of material, his office needs the federal government to release roughly $13 million of their asset forfeiture money. He says it's frozen as part of a separate investigation involving a previous administration. We can put more people on it. We could work essentially 24 hours a day. Prosecutors have been able to link Hewerman to the murders through burner phones, a manifesto with details about carrying out their deaths and DNA. But the defense team is hoping a hearing to challenge some of the DNA methods used will work in their favor. The nuclear DNA should be precluded and has no basis in science and should not come into play in this trial. Hewerman's estranged wife wasn't in court. His attorney didn't comment on recent visits at the jail. As far as the case is concerned, he says he plans to file motions to separate the first four charged killings from the other two and explore a possible change of venue. I don't know where it is that we're going to be able to get a fair and impartial jury. Now, Hewerman is still a suspect in other killings and he could face charges down the road. As for the trial, no date has been set yet. He's due back in court for his next conference on December 17th. That's this week's Crime in the City. Subscribe for more at youtube.com slash fox5ny.